just tell me a little bit about the work that you do with Refugee Rights Action Network. I perform a number of roles in the Refugee Rights Action Network. Um, one of those roles is visiting in um, immigration detention centres in Australia, so visiting asylum seekers who are currently detained, and sometimes uh, doing advocacy, so if people have certain issues connecting them with human rights bodies or connecting them with lawyers. In some cases, if there is a sort of huge um, human rights abuse going on, we will link people with journalists. And my other role is um, talking with asylum seekers in the offshore detention centres, Menace Island and Nauru, and similarly um, linking people with journalists to uh, help keep the public aware of what is actually going on inside these detention centres. Oh, okay, so you're like the liaison between the two. Yeah. That must be interesting. So do, <laughs> do people try to find out who's talking to who? Um, generally not. They, it's like, um, because if it's on the onshore detention centre, then I can say I'm a visitor and that's sufficient information for them. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, sometimes they'll link up with asylum seekers themselves. So we'll ask, pe we'll ask people, do you actually want the contact of the journalist and you can do this yourself? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, usually they're, they're happy with knowing that we uh, um, talk, are connected with people in the centres. And you mentioned that you have both Tamil and Sinhalese people on bridging visas in the community waiting for claims to be processed. What is their experience of that at the moment? How has it changed over time? Um, I think many people were excited just to get out of detention. So mm -hmm. one of my friends was detained for 18 months um, in, in Nauru and then was moved to the mainland. So there was initially excitement about finally being free. Mm -hmm. For how many but months? Sorry, eighteen months. Eighteen months. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah a very long time. <laughs> okay. So initially, they're, they're they're happy to be outside, but then they're faced with a situation where um, now the policies changed slightly. But for the year or so they were out, they were unable to work. They were unable to study. They were given very little money from the government to basically survive on. Um, and they've been told that they'll never be permanently settled in Australia, so people are stuck in a state of limbo. Mm -hmm. This has a huge impact on people's mental health because they're, well, one, perpetually in fear that they will be sent back mm -hmm. to Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and perpetually in fear that they'll be pulled back in detention for minor, minor offences. I mean, people have, you know, not had a ticket on public transport and have been pulled back in the detention centre and there's, you know, mental health effects of not being able to do anything. I mean, in a, like in Australia, people generally, you know, have to work or study to do something to keep mentally healthy, but they're basically stuck not being able to do anything. Mm -hmm. And and how has uh, the Action Network tried to help them? We don't have um, specific programs to help people on bridging visas, but mm -hmm. our role is to try and raise awareness in the community about how hard it actually is to be on a bridging visa and, the, you know, the problems this causes, that it's not easy for people to be living outside if they have no access to work or study mm -hmm. and that they're, they're still stuck in limbo. There's no resolution. They're not they're still not safe, they're still essentially running, they're still in the refugee journey until they have permanent resettlement. Okay, and the Tamils have come because of persecution, is that the same reason for the Sinhalese? Um, generally yes, I think many of the, a lot of the um, Sinhalese come from a village where the population is half um, where people are half Sinhalese, half Tamil, okay. so where they're, they've married between them. Mm -hmm. But a lot of Sinhalese people would also, for example, been been against the government as well. Okay. So they could have spoken out against the government and been persecuted because of that okay. or supported, openly supported the Tamils. So now that the government has changed in Sri Lanka, what are their thoughts? Are any of them excited about it? Do they think there's going to be change? Do they want to go back? There was... I think they, they watched the, my, my, in my network of friends anyway, watched the election closely, but I think they're still incredibly cynical about the changes. They still fear going back. Uh, personally, I think it's still not safe for them to go back. People who've gone back before have been um, captured and tortured, and I don't think that there's any guarantee of safety at the moment. I mean, they're still not letting in human rights observers, so we have no way of ensuring that when people are sent back, they're going to be safe. I know the case for many people that I'm friends with at least that they would go home if they 
backwards. Mm. Like my friends, they say, you know, my dream is to take my Australian friends back to the village where I was born and show them, you know, my home, mm. my culture, mm. so that with people it's, it's a willingness to go back and that the fact that they don't go back I think is indicative that they genuinely believe it's not safe and I think there's been substantial proof that it is not safe for asylum seekers from Sri Lanka to go back. What was their reaction to the Sri Lankan and um, the former Sri Lankan ambassador, I should probably say, for Australia when the documentary was aired? I think on ABC there was a story aired about um, the torture some of the victims w- went through, and he denied it furiously after the, the story had been aired in a live crossover segment. Um, what was their reaction to that? I think generally just anger, but perhaps not being surprised. I think it is, yeah, Yeah. there has been a continual denial from the Sri Lankan government and its representatives of the torture that has gone in Sri Lanka, that has happened in Sri Lanka to refugees from there, even though it's been been really well documented, like, by by independent human rights bodies. So Amnesty International, a group called Stop Torture, and people, you know, have the, the physical wounds of their torture that they can present as proof of what happened to them, but it's still denied by the government consistently yeah, on think, both a political I, level. I, I think he did say in that story that he considered the wounds to be self-inflicted. <laughs> so yes, it, was, <laughs> it was very hard to imagine how exactly they could have been self-inflicted. Um, but right now, Maitri Palasarisena, the current new president of Sri Lanka, is talking to Modi in India about uh, possibly repatriation of the refugees that are there, the 24,000 kids that have been born uh, to refugees there and all the refugees that have gone over there since the war started. Though some people have made the point that until you repatriate those in camps in Sri Lanka and give and make arrangements for land to be given back and all of that, you can't send refugees back from wherever else they are in the world to be repatriated. And um, we've also seen the first Dog on the Moon cartoon this weekend that came out about the refugees that were sent back and then ultimately went off to Nepal and were given refugee status. So, I mean, what what do they do? They know of these developments. What do they think of these? Does, does that change anything? Do they do they see those? Um, steps that uh, Mighty Pala Sirison is taking as something um, positive? I think we, we had a conversation the other night and I think their belief is that, um, you know, he's just won the election, so he's being quite uh, conciliatory to the Tamils, but when the next election comes around, he may switch again to be quite critical and hard on the Tamils to win the Sinhalese votership, Mm -hmm. but I think there there just still is a huge amount of scepticism, like as much as he's declaring that it's safe for them to come back, I think that's not really a guarantee or a risk people can take, like whilst you say, he says publicly Mm -hmm. they can come back and he's taking these steps, I think when it comes down to it, I mean there's still a huge military presence in the north, there has been, um, you know, people moved into where Tamils used to live, so I think practically it still hasn't been thought through. There's still no guarantee of safety. I mean, this the question of what do people have to go back to, like if their houses mm-hmm. are still even there, or you know, mm-hmm. those practical questions haven't been answered. And he does have a hundred day program um, that he came into power with. So there's the question of the um, the fact that he can kickstart some of these things, but it may take longer to actually put these things in place, and he may not uh, win at the next parliamentary elections in April after all that. So there's a question of whoever, if someone else does win, whoever comes after him, whether they will continue that. So, yeah, I can see why um, they might still be reluctant. Um, What do you think the Australian government needs to do next, then? I think that the Australian government, not just towards Sri Lanka, refugees from Sri Lanka, but to all of the people who've been, uh, been proven to be refugees in Australia, is to give them permanent resettlement. I think what we're doing at the moment is incredibly inhumane and it's just postponing the problem instead of dealing with it. And I don't think that we we should push people to go back when they're uncomfortable to do so. Like, if we can't guarantee people's safety, I think they should be given refugee status and the option of resettlement in Australia. Do you have trouble trying to get the 
concept to to the public in general that they are not illegal, that they have a right to seek refuge, that we are contravening international law, and that we are using taxpayers' money to um, fund these centres that seem to, you know, the other day we were looking at the UN definition for genocide and uh, one of the points underneath it says part of the definition of genocide is to put in place certain conditions that restrict people so much, a group of people so much that it finds it, you're basically denying them their rights. And that seems to be, from what we've heard, like what happens in the detention centres. So that taxpayers are somewhat complicit and culpable because it's their money that's been used to fund these things. Yeah, I, I think it's a huge struggle. I think consciousness is slowly changing in the public with the recent round of events at Manus Island that people are starting to look into it a bit more. But it's very hard to convince people when you consistently have government sort of re reinforcing people's misconceptions. So people's misconceptions have come straight from, uh, like, the media and the government using terms like illegal boat arrivals or illegals and, you know, perpetuating this myth when, you know, if you hear the other side of the story that even before we had offshore centres, it's about one-tenth of the cost to process people in the community. So it's more economically efficient and it saves people's taxpayers' dollars and it's, it's more humane. Um, one of the guys I visited said that the when when you you know he's in the detention and he's asking for something, uh, an officer was quite rude with him and said, you know, this is my taxpayer dollars, I'm paying for this. And he said, well, if you let me out of detention, I I would be able to work and contribute taxes. He's like, give me your job, I would be happy to work. And this idea that people are you know willingly being in detention, mm -hmm. having everything paid for them, but people want to be outside, they want to be free, they want to work and they want to contribute. So it's this hypocrisy to accuse them of, you know, costing us money when it's us putting them in that position. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, definitely this idea that we punish a certain group of people to deter another group of people is, is abhorrent, it is a human rights abuse. It's not likely to change, though, if the Labour government comes in. The general policy direction is not likely to change. I think it's very hard to tell, but, I mean, since Labour was the one who sort of introduced, reintroduced offshore processing, there is little difference now between the major parties. But um, I would hope that there, there would be some difference at least, at least you know, dealing with, the, with this issue of all these people being in the community without visas or unbridging visas. Is there anything I've forgotten to ask you that you want to tell me? Just that from my personal experience of visiting people who've uh, come here as refugees from Sri Lanka, I would, you know, most people come with horrific stories of being tortured, of trying to seek asylum in other places, and Australia is being their last resort. So I think you know there really needs to be a push to let the public know that people have genuine refugee claims and the conditions that they're fleeing from. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> Thank you so much.